Hey guys, today we're going to talk about diners. Most of you all know that we have an art show coming up. All of your two-dimensional or flat artwork will be on display in the halls. However, all the food sculptures that we've been working on will be on display in the art room. And we're transforming the art room into something called the JES Diner. Now I've had a lot of kids ask me, what's a diner? And usually the other kids will say, well, it's a, just a restaurant. It's actually not just a restaurant. The word diner really means dining car because originally diners were created out of old train dining cars. That's right. When a train was no longer usable, restaurant owners who were looking to have a business but couldn't afford to buy a building would buy these old broken down train cars, transform them into restaurants. The only problem was they usually weren't always the cleanest of establishments, which is how they got the name Greasy Spoon. Diners were very popular from the 1920s up until about the 70s, until fast food restaurants came and pretty much hurt the business of diners. But Let's talk about how artists have been influenced by diners. And one of the most famous paintings of a diner is one that you might have seen before. It's by an artist whose name is Edward Hopper. This painting is called Night Hawks, and it was created in 1942, shortly after World War II ended. Take a look at this painting. It's pretty bleak. It's very dark, must be late at night, very few customers. The town looks almost strangely deserted. And even though there's a group of people in the diner, they all have kind of a lonely, isolated feel, which is exactly the feeling that Edward Hopper was going for. Take a look at some of the characters in the painting. This customer right here was said to have a large nose, which is why Edward Hopper named the painting Night Hawks, as though the gentleman had a, a nose or a beak like a hawk. This guy right here, we often see in diners because this is what's called a soda jerk. Not because the guy is actually a jerk, it's just because he operated the soda machine, which had a handle that was pretty famous for having a little bit of a kick to it, which would cause the person operating it to jerk. Hence the name Soda Jerk. You can usually spot them by their paper hats and their white jackets. A lot of artists have been inspired by diners and Edward Hopper's painting of a diner. Check this sculpture out. This sculpture was created by George Seagal. To create this sculpture, he actually brought in part of a diner. Then he created plaster casts of people. So you know if somebody breaks their arm, they get a cast. Well, instead of just wrapping that plaster cast around an arm, George Seagal had people pose, sit still, cover them in those plaster strips, and then that's how he created those sculptures. There's no people inside there anymore, in case you're thinking that, but that's how those sculptures were made. And this one is called The Diner. Another artist influenced by diners and by Edward Hopper is Ralph Goings. This is a painting, believe it or not, a very realistic one. In fact, so realistic that we could say that this painting looks like a photo, which is where it gets its name, photo realism. It's cool to be able to actually see inside of a diner and it almost looks like a train car. Look at the metal ceiling. Look how long and narrow the dining room is. Most diners have a counter, bar stools, a place behind the counter for the workers to prepare the food, and sometimes seating, like you can see off to the left, the benches. Another artist who paints in that photorealistic style is an artist who lives right here in Nashville. Her name is Diane Craig, and you might even recognize this sign because this restaurant is in Nashville. It's called the Loveless Cafe. Check out that sign because we are making our own diner signs today. 
All right, so to make your diner sign, the first thing you need to do is decide a couple of things. Do you want to have a daytime picture or a nighttime picture? Do you want to have your artwork formatted so that it's vertical or do you want it horizontal? Those choices are totally up to you. There is no right or wrong way to go about doing it. I'm going to have both of my pieces of paper go this way so you can see. Now I said both because I'm going to show you how to do both kinds of pictures, meaning a daytime and a nighttime. But you need to decide which one you are going to do. So if I'm going to do, let's say, a daytime scene on this one, then I'll use a white this is called a construction paper crayon. Uh, that sounds a little fancy to me. I'm just going to call it a crayon. You can use a white crayon. And with that white crayon, you can just go ahead and draw clouds if you want to. Maybe it's a day that has no clouds in the sky. And obviously you can't see my clouds because I'm drawing white on white. So my clouds are pretty camouflaged. But some of you guys know where I'm going with this. You know this is called wax resist. Sometimes we use oil pastels and we call that an oil resist. Wax, just like oil, resists or pushes off the water when you're watercolor painting. So it really works perfectly if you press very firmly. So if you apply a lot of pressure when you're doing things like clouds, then this trick of wax resist works even better. Now, if I'm doing a nighttime scene, I could still use white because you know there's clouds in the sky at night. But I think for that, I'm actually going to just use yellow and orange and I'm going to create I think a moon. So I'm creating kind of a nighttime scene with a moon in the sky. And because the moon is not empty, I have to color it in just like those clouds. I was filling those all the way in. Maybe I can add some stars with a variety of colors. Oops. Color it in like I just said. And again, I'm applying some pressure because I really want to make sure that those things... Now, before you start painting, make sure that you have written your name and teacher code on the back of your paper because once these become saturated with paint and water, it's going to be pretty impossible to flip that paper over and write your name. So don't forget to do that very important step. Now, the watercolor paint you'll be using will look different than mine. So yours will actually just be in a cup. If you are making a nighttime scene, you'll know which cup to use, and a daytime scene, you'll have a lighter blue to use. So, it's for me, I'm using the watercolor pan. You won't even have to add water, you lucky duck. But mine, as you know, with most watercolor paint, you have to wake them up. So I'm just adding a little bit of water to this one to wake it up. Now, I really made sure to press hard with that crayon so that it would resist. So let's see if it did. And it looks like it's going to resist, resist it pretty well. So look at the wax is pushing that right off, that paint right off of there. That's the awesomeness of wax resist. Now I want this to be a nighttime sky, so I'm trying to add a darker shade of blue. If I'm making a shade, that means I have to add some black. All right, so that's what it would look like if I'm painting a nighttime painting. So let me finish that. Okay, so I've painted my nighttime scene and my daytime scene, both which you can see the light reflecting on the, the water. You can tell both of them are really wet. So I'm going to take a break, let those dry, and I can work on the next step. All right, cool cats. For this next phase, you are going to be cutting out three things, but you're going to be cutting out each thing twice. So three times two, mm, you do the math. Oh, six, bingo. That's right. You're going to end up with six things cut out. So you're going to need to cut out two arrows for your sign, two of this shape, and two of that and for each you want to use different colors. So I'm going to start with my arrow. So I need to pick a good color for an arrow. You're going to have a huge box of scraps to choose from. I think I want this and I said I need to cut out two. Maybe I'll go with hmm, that one's not going to fit. Maybe I'll have to go with something larger like this guy. All right so I'm going to take both of them stack them together. Use the back. Remember we always trace on the back that way nobody can see our pencil lines and trace. So I'm doing that with this. 
I'm going to do that twice with this guy. So I think I'll go with um, I think I'll go with these two papers. So I've got two papers. Flip them both over, and I will get ready to trace. And same with this one. Two papers flipped over. Put this on the back, and I like to put it down in a corner so I don't waste as much paper and trace. When I'm done tracing, one, two, three, I'm going to cut these out. Now the cool thing is, is that you only have to trace once, even though you're cutting twice. When you cut, just hold both of the pieces of paper together as you cut. So I went ahead and I traced all three. And now I'm about to cut, just like we talked about, I'm going to hold both pieces of paper together. That way, as I'm cutting, I only have to cut three times as opposed to six times. Why don't you go ahead and do that step, and then we'll talk about what to do with all of these pieces of paper. So why did I have you cut out two of each thing? Well, because those diner signs were made out of metal and they were usually very thick. So we wanna show dimension in our diner sign. If we were only going to use an arrow to show our diner sign, it would appear very flat. But if you take that other one you cut out, and it does not matter which one goes on top, so you might want to play around and flip them back and forth and see which one you think would actually look better. I like the yellow on top better. But if we glued it like this, you can see it looks very flat. But if you gently push your sign up or your arrow up a little bit, you can see all of a sudden it creates the optical illusion, the eyeball magic, that this sign appears to be three-dimensional. We know it's not but it's the eyeball magic, the optical illusion that makes it appear three-dimensional. So now that you've got your pieces cut out and probably your painting is dry, you can start to toy around with your composition. Composition is where you're placing things. So I know I want my arrow pointing one way. If I had not painted my moon there, I could have even had my sign going this way. So you might even want to try moving your paper around, moving your arrow around, seeing what composition or placement of things looks best to you. And once you've settled on that, I'm really liking the way this looks. Then you need to decide where the other parts of your sign goes. And I'm trying to think which one I like better. Do I like blue? Hmm. Oh yeah, blue better. So... That also has to drop a little bit. I'm trying to make it so it looks as though somebody's looking up at the sign, in which case they would see the bottom of the sign. So that could go there. And maybe this last piece. Yeah, maybe that could go right there. So be thinking about or over here where you want to place your things. That's called your composition before you start gluing them down because you know once it's glued down it's not going anywhere. Now before you do glue you'll want to go ahead and write on your signs. So I think I want my diner sign to say something like eat at Miss Stevens or eat at the diner cafe. So think about what might be a clever name for your diner or for your sign before you just start writing on it. So when, once you've got that figured out, then you can use your crayons to start writing on this and this. If it helps you to write with a pencil first so you know what size to make your letters and what font or style of letters you want to use, then go for it. Okay, so I got my parts of my sign finished. I haven't glued anything yet, but I did want to show you that I drew some extra things like lines underneath. I used different styles of writing or different fonts to make my sign interesting. I even went around with my um, construction paper crayons and decorated the edge a little bit. And I even thought, since I hadn't glued anything yet, I might even do that with my arrow. It always helps to test these construction paper crayons on the back because you're never quite sure what kind of color you're going to get. But it just might make my sign look a little bit more interesting if I take the time 
and make mine different and unique. Just like me and my fine dining establishment, I'm going to make my sign look unique. So I'm just coloring around this. If I wanted that arrow that's underneath to have that th more of a three-dimensional quality like I did with my other little signs, all I did was draw lines on this. Now I don't want to get lines on here, so maybe I'll scoot that out of the way. And I just took a darker color and I drew lines coming away from the arrow. This is just extra stuff. You're now just going the extra mile like you always do to Fabulous Town. So let me finish that. Let's see. Yeah, I like the way that looks. I think that helps me put it all back together. Now when you get ready to glue, I would start with the pieces on the bottom first. So I'm just going to move these out of the way. I know where I want this to go. Now you know in my room you usually use your glue cup, but in your classroom you probably have a glue bottle. But I know you know how to use glue bottles, but make sure you don't overdo it with the glue. You know a little dab will do it. Also helps if you open the glue bottle. Wouldn't that be nice? So you're just going to just give it a couple of dots. When you're done gluing, don't forget to turn your paper over and really massage the paper so that the glue can do its job and stick. That'd also be a good time as you're massaging the paper to make sure you've written your name and teacher code, whatever code you use when you come to my room, on the back. Now your final step. When you come to my art room and you have at least some of this done. You don't have to have everything finished. You know we can work on it in my room. But once you've got some of it done, then we can neonize your sign with some puffy paint. So we can actually add those neon looking lights to your sign. But a couple of things you might want to do in case you happen to finish early to add a little bit more shadow and depth to your sign. I just took a dark color construction paper crayon and I'm just coloring underneath back and forth creating a little bit of a shadow. I also made a pole to hold my sign up since we can't have floating diner signs unless your diner happens to take place on Mars. I also did the same thing there. I just colored underneath. Could do that there just to add a little bit more depth. All right, I am so excited to see how your diner signs turn out. Have fun, you guys.